All right, joining us in the studio this morning for her thoughts on the push for federalism and later on we'll discuss as February is National Arts Month. We have with us Senator Lauren Legarda. Welcome to Hot Copy once again, Senator Hi, Lauren. Thank you. It's always for great to be to here. Yes, good morning. All right. Now, you have the Senate already um, hearing different thoughts when it comes to charter change. Yes. Do we need to change it? How do we change it? What do we change? What are your fears when it comes to the push for charter change? Well, first of all, Karen, it's very clear that we have a bicameral Congress, meaning we will have the votes of the lower house, Congress, a house of representatives. Sometimes people mistakenly call Congress just the lower house and the Senate, of course, of 24 senators, but right now we're only 23. And so we have uh, resolutions calling for a uh, constitutional assembly with the Senate and the lower house voting separately. Yeah. So that's very clear. I think that's a non-negotiable element here that we have a bicameral Congress and therefore it is envisioned that the vote should be bicameral as well. Now, second, uh, what's the timeline and which comes first? Because presently, we have been actively hearing uh, with um, Senator Mig Subiri as a subcom chair, the Bangsamoro Basic Law. Okay. It's very clear that we must provide economic empowerment, uh, political and fiscal autonomy to our Bangsamoro brothers and sisters. In fact, as I speak to you now, they are in Sulu, in Tawi-Tawi, in Basilan tomorrow, in Zamboanga. I cannot because I'm here with you yeah, yeah. and I have other matters um, to work on in the Senate as chairman of the Committee on Finance. I wish I could be there yeah, because yeah. these are areas of Mindanao that I used to frequent when I yeah. was in television like you. Now, now, these consultations will refine the Bangsamoro basic law, which the Senate and the House are crafting. I believe that this is essential to come first mm. so that the long delayed MOA AD, which was deemed unconstitutional, and now the refined or even better version of the Bangsamoro basic law. Uh, can finally be enacted. I am hoping, Karen, that a good, authentic, genuine reform version of the Bangsaboro Basic Law can be enacted before the state of the nation of the president. Why mm -hmm. do I say okay. this? Okay. It's not for That's the quite soon, no? It's so, not for the speech. It's yeah. because as chairman of the Committee on Finance, I need to fund it. Yeah. I hate to see a law enacted by the end of the year or even in January next year before the midterm elections without funding. We cannot enact the law without funding. You remember the Tertiary Education Act yeah. when it was passed mid-year yes. and there was no funding in the start. But it's good we were able to find the funds in the yeah. Senate, in the lower house, for the $40 billion to implement it. Same with the BBL. We hope that it could be uh, passed. We hope that the agencies of government who are affected or concerned with implementing the BBL would put it in their national expenditure program or the president's budget so that when the budget goes to the lower house and eventually to the Senate by the last quarter of this year, the funding mechanism is already incorporated. Ang hirap naman, Karen. Yeah, yeah. Naghahabol ako sa Desyembre dahil napasa yung batas at walang pondo. Yeah. That would be a great disappointment. Okay. Now, why, in relation to the push for federalism, you have sectors and even Malacanang, of course, making this a priority. Why is it important to first pass the Bangsamoro Basic Law? Will it be a good test case if federalism will work? Um, yes to your question. It's a good test case, but it's been long in coming because we have the autonomous region in Muslim in the now. Um, Fed, uh, Ramos time yeah. that was enacted. It was uh, clearly intended to provide peace, order, economic empowerment. Um, sorry to say, it, it seemed to have not succeeded, mm -hmm. uh, even if there were resources that were allocated. It's a problem of governments, a problem of form. Let's not blame anyone. It was well intentioned. Now, we're improving on it by giving genuine political and fiscal autonomy and something that is uh, aligned with the Constitution. And we hope that we are able to provide the resources needed for this autonomy so that uh, there could be peace finally in this region. Yes, it's a good precursor so that when we 
launch federalism, when we even discuss it, we can see this is what we provided for Abangsamoro Brothers. This is probably how it's going to look in the regional uh, states that we will establish. We're not even sure on the format. Uh, that we want for federalism. We're not even certain mm -hmm. with the many thoughts and ideas on changes in the Constitution, whether it will just be economic in nature or political because they want to, to divide the country into federal states. We don't know if we will follow the present uh, geographical allocation of regions in the federal states. So that's still, to me, to my mind at least, yeah. hazy. What I'd like to focus on now is uh, the Bangsamoro Basic Law and actually uh, funding it. And federalism is worth studying, it's worth considering. It's a concept that works in other jurisdictions, in other countries. It's something that probably excites us, it's yeah. new. But it's also something I think we should take a second look at and be wary about. Because some say that this would just engender or bring about uh, political dynasty which already exists. In fact, there should be an anti-political dynasty oh. law. Should that go first? Um, should the lower house do that first? I think it, it should be uh, part or mainstreamed in uh, the version that we have, although it's been discussed and there is quite resistance in the inclusion of a political dynasty provision because nationally it's not even yet a law, uh, which makes sense. On the other hand, uh, we should look at all the safeguards. But second, what's most important, I think, it should be constitutionally aligned, they should be politically autonomous, but the most important is fiscal autonomy. All of these talk if you don't provide the resources, if they have to beg the central government for their resources for education, for livelihood, for agriculture, then it's to naught. Mm -hmm. And so I said that in the hearing. Yeah. So, Senator, do we need to change the form of government to improve the fiscal autonomy and uh, improve the economic status of several provinces? Or is there any other way? Some have brought out revision may not be necessary only economic amendments that's another possibility looking i'm i'm open to anything that's a reason why we want to listen and join every consultation yes uh some say that it's a matter of uh, simply amending even the local government code. Uh, some even say that when you look at the ills plaguing our society, what are the top five problems? It's really employment, livelihood, it's economics in nature, and uh, illegal drugs, and peace and order, which is an insurgency. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so and do these you are, need to change the government My question for that? is, uh, this is a problem of lack of not government resources bringing government rec resources closer to the people it's a matter of the need for better closer governance just yesterday i was meeting with the regional directors of the department of social welfare and development in a briefing and i mentioned about certain far-flung barangays which have never seen any government entity and when I go there, they said, you're the only national figure who has yeah. been to this uh -oh. far-flung coastal area of indigenous peoples. So do you need federalism and so to change that system? You just need to bring government closer to the people. Now, I am not against federalism. I am not even pushing it now. I am open-minded. I would like to listen to the experts, both former Chief Justice Davide and former Chief Justice Renato Puno have um, opposite poles in their views yeah. and when you listen to one they make sense so it's really important to review all of these views uh, the experts the academe the people on the street the people in the hinterlands the people who need it most okay is it the cure all is it a panacea are we providing false hope will it really solve the decades if not centuries old problem of um of division yeah. in our country. Okay, I had uh, former Chief Justice Hilario Davide on the show, and he said something quite interesting. He said, in fact, if you move towards federalism, he said you'll have more families, more political clans that will come into power. There will be more of them. Yes. Do you see that as a possibility? Everything is a possibility, Karen. And uh, now we know political clans and political dynasty and armed groups exist. That's a reality in Philippine politics, especially in areas mm -hmm. in Mindanao. I'm not saying all. And so when you concentrate power in regional states, yeah. would that not bring about stronger political warlordism? That's a question mark. I'm yeah. not making a statement. Yeah. Will it bring about 
more power for those into illegal activities like illegal numbers game and illegal drugs and criminality and syndicates? I'm not certain. I think we should look into that because if you elect senators nationally, yeah. it would be difficult for syndicates and those living in the underworld to influence us. Yeah. If you regionalize it and simplify the election to represent the states, I don't know how small the states would be, a region, a couple of provinces, it would be easier, I'll say it, to buy votes to influence yeah. the results. That's on a very extreme end. That's not my view. I've heard that said. Yeah. On the other hand, it would be great to have closer representation to the grassroots by having state representatives or senators, but we have it now as the congressmen are representatives of certain districts. So yeah. uh, it's worth looking into. Okay, what's the effect if the Senate is abolished? Because clearly you have Speaker Alvarez and some other congressmen saying that in the end you have senators wanting to protect their position. Well, obviously it wouldn't be you. You are retiring. Uh, I mean, your, your term is expiring as a senator in, am I right? Is it 2019 or 2022? June. 30, 2019. 2019. My term uh -oh. is ending, but I am not retired. Yeah, okay, my apology. <laughs> my, so, not retiring yeah. from so life. The, ar the argument <laughs> yes, of yes. you have senators essentially wanting to protect their uh, positions. I'm saying this because yes. it wouldn't be you because your term is yes. expiring. Yes, yes. But what's the difference if a Senate exists? Well, we've seen yeah. in the bicameral nature of our government that there's check and balance. Why would the Senate want to abolish itself? Not because of its own self-protection, but because of its role in our democracy. And you've seen the esteemed, distinguished women and men who have walked the halls of the Senate. You've seen how laws have been enacted and how democracy and the voice of the people have been protected and enhanced because of the Philippine Senate. And so would we allow ourselves to be abolished? I don't think so. Yeah. Do you think a 2019 plebiscite, because clearly they put 2018 out of the picture, a 2019 plebiscite for charter change is too soon? 2019. A plebiscite to first mm, ask the public. During the uh, midterm elections. I think that's possible. 2018 would be difficult okay. because we're already in February. But next year, isasabay na yung midterm elections with the plebiscite, I think that's possible. But really, we're working on so many things. We're working on the BBL. Yeah. By July, August, we'll be working on the GAA, on the, gen on the budget of next year. And then we have so many other priorities. I have the Budget Reform Act. I have the uh, right-sizing bill, which are priorities of the Department of Budget. There's so many other laws, but federalism or even possible changes to the Constitution are a priority. I agree with that. It should be discussed lengthily, exhaustively, comprehensively. We should not say no right away. While I've mentioned what I hear from experts yeah. and other sectors, it does not mean that I am averse to changing uh, the form mm. of government. But it you want people to be careful of and course. be conscientious. Of course. Uh -oh. Yes, because it, we should not give the people false hopes and we should really assess the ills of society and find out whether this can be cured, this can be solved through a change in the form of government or clear, or just by bringing resources closer to the people or through amending certain laws which already exist to make it easier. Okay. So there could be many, many options. All right. Now, speaking of can this still be solved, you also are chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Yes. And Senator Bamakino recently filed a resolution. I signed it yesterday, oh, our you joint did? resolution. Yes. Asking the Senate uh, uh, Foreign Relations Committee, which you chair, to probe the oh. government's foreign policy oh, I direction. Thought, I thought you were referring to the uh, implementation, I'm sorry, okay. about the uh, tertiary education law because we talked about it in BAM. Oh, you're okay. talking about the the uh, uh yeah uh, the resolution yes. he filed that the committee should already investigate not investigate but probe into the government's foreign policy direction mm. so right now you're hearing uh, very controversial statements from the government and you also have experts professor batong bakal and many more now there's 
um, a statement of now there's no ban on foreign research in Philippine rice, which is Benham rice. And you have Professor Batung Bakal saying you need Filipinos to explore in, yes, in, in yes. Benham rice. I think the president already uh, declared that yesterday, that uh, he wants Filipino scientists to limit it. I, I fully agree. Yeah. And we know very well that all foreign policy emanates from the head of state, from the president. And I respect that and I fully support that. The declaration that Filipino scientists uh, must um, explore, explore, yeah, yeah. explore, research, and in fact, I funded it this year. Uh, you did? As, for Filipino scientists to explore? Uh, in fact, let me correct myself. Yeah, yeah. As early as last year, uh, people may not know, and um, even Malacanang may not know, that I already funded the research in Benham Rice for marine biodiversity. If I and may it was say, never I, used? No, it's being used. Okay. So, Last year. All right. Uh, Director Mundita Lim knows that. Uh, former Secretary Pai of DNR knows that. In fact, I funded it, I think, let me see, 2016. Yeah. But if would I'm you not need mistaken, a different budget for scientists to explore? Uh, to science, do surveys? Or scientists, that would be enough? Uh, no, we need okay. additional budget. Okay. I'm not even certain if it's last. It could be 2016. Two years ago, I already envisioned that Benham Rice, because we knew about Benham Rice since many years ago. And I, in, in the funding, there was a 500 million funding that I excised from the National Greening Program that I put into marine biodiversity. And of this 500 million, a large part of it was dedicated to doing a database of the marine biodiversity in Benham Rice. That is a 2016 or 17 General Appropriations Act budget under the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. So you're, it's actually a scoop. It's the first time I'm telling anyone in television because sometimes the budget is too complicated for people. It's a matter of numbers. But so they can use that for exploration existing? It's being used. In fact, yeah, yeah. after this, I'm glad you reminded me, I will ask the DENR how they spent the funds we gave them because what's what I wanted then was to find out the situation of our coral reefs because our coral reefs 90% are deteriorating 99% are dying and we only have 1% in excellent condition my god okay. this is the home of our fish and our fish catch yeah. is depleting because and food and food, food yes yeah. for, for our fisher folks for our people in, in coastal areas uh, food of our country and so I, I thought it would be a good idea to do a database inventory of our marine biodiversity in Benham Rice which I provided in our General Appropriations Act and that's the biggest form of legislation now we will continue to add in the 2019 budget scientific research for Filipinos in Benham Rice and other areas, uh, coastal areas around our archipelago. Okay. Now, um, of course, the chief architect of foreign policy is the president. Yes. What can the Senate do if the president is going to one direction? What, what can the Senate do? Well, of course, the Senate is an independent institution uh, in our form of government. The president, of course, uh, declares the foreign policy. We may support, we may suggest. Uh, the opposition and minority may, uh, oh, we, we can speak out. Okay. Yes, because we can conduct any investigation. We can conduct uh, any research. We can yeah. conduct consultation. Because I, I know that starting off President Duterte's term, the DFA uh, issued a moratorium when it comes to exploring the Reed Bank. Is it time to lift that already? I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about there was a resolution yeah. in the Senate. I'll have to check that. Yeah, because it's yeah. essentially um, alternative sources of power if Malampaya runs yes. out. Yes. So is it already time? But you have, um, I mean, supporters, of course, uh, saying that um, it could affect our relationship with mm, China. With China. Yeah. That's so, a very, uh, it's not just a matter of research and, um, and source of power yeah. uh, or source of resources, but it's got political, geopolitical implications. And so when we move and when we fund and when we do research and when we explore, we must also see the political security implications of our action. You know, okay. Karen, being a uh, uh, national security uh, person, yeah. expert if I may say, that's what I studied for my masteral course, all my actions, my moves, my thinking is based not just on intelligence, information and research, but also on the 
political, social, political, economic, religious, and um, implications, military implications of our actions. Okay. And so I assess everything. Okay. Well, before we go uh, to a quick break, I just want to add this. We're going to talk about National Arts Month and Dayo. Um, as the head of finance, uh, this year starts free college tuition yes, already, yes. 40 billion to be rolled yes. out. Now, the challenge we had Popoy De Vera on the shows, the new CHED OIC. What is the challenge for implementation? How would you, what, did you discuss it? Because when this students... Is, this was long in coming. In yeah. fact, we passed the law more than a year ago. But that's a and, lot, 40 billion is a yes. lot of money to uh, We out. passed the law and uh, the CHED should be ready to implement the law. I am told that it will take them to the middle of this year to implement it. Okay. But I think they should implement, not I think, they should, we have a Senate resolution, they should implement it now because the funds are there and uh, the children, the youth should not be charged for their college mm -hmm. education. And what the Senate and Congress actually passed was not just tuition fees of state universities and colleges, but also local government yeah, created yeah. institutions and state owned technical vocational institutions, not just matricula or tuition, but also miscellaneous expenses. Yeah. But even if we had passed that for 40 billion funding, there is still the tulong dunong uh, for indigent scholars, for yeah, those yeah. who are not enrolled in state-owned or government-owned institutions, who may be in private educational institutions can still access assistance mm. from government. Many people don't know that. Some people don't even know that there is free college education in government-owned college uh, institutions. Yeah, yeah. It's important. Wag po kayo magpapasingil oh, sa mga kolehiyo na ang gobyerno ang may-ari. Okay. Dahil may pondo na po. Okay. Isang tanong na lang before we go to a quick break. What is the best way to implement it? Did you talk to Chad about this? Should the money be given ahead to the colleges even before registration? Because right now what they're thinking is everybody registers first. The college bills Chad. I mean, I'm thinking if I'm the school, what a headache, right? Yes. You can't move without money. But the funds are available. Okay. And the funds can be downloaded already. Prior to enrollment? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's just a matter of the Department of Budget and Management and the Commission on Higher Education and the state universities and colleges talking and cooperating and fast-tracking the downloading of funds to implement the law. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll probably uh, call a roundtable meeting <laughs> for that. <laughs> yes. Okay. We're going to continue our conversation with Senator Lauren Legarda. We're going to talk about Dayao and also February is na uh, National Arts Month. After this short break, Hot Copy will be right back. Welcome back to Head Start. It's all about creativity and the arts this February 2018 as the nation celebrates National Arts Month. The National Commission for Culture and the Arts, or NCCA, is spearheading several events to celebrate the seven arts with the theme Ani ng Sining, Alab ng Sining. And still with us on Hot Copy, also to talk about Dayao, which is still on ANC, a legislator who is pushing for the formation of Department of Culture. Do we really need one at this point? She will explain. Senator Lauren Legarda. Okay, we need a Department of Culture. This is your new advocacy. It's not a new advocacy. Okay. It's a lifelong advocacy like... Uh environment and climate. And okay. remember, we had the Department of Education, Arts and Culture. Yeah. And it was collapsed to just Department of Education, which is yeah, yeah. a gargantuan task. And Arts and Culture is taken care of by a commission, the National Commission on Culture, that has various government agencies under it. But it's a commission that is a policy-making body. To create a Department of Culture, we would institutionalize the mandate, the programs, yeah. the policies, the projects, and activities yeah. so that there could be a cultural revolution. We could actually, in the words of national artist Chair Almario of the NCSA, we could reimagine 
the nation. Yeah. Imagine yeah. the excitement it would yeah. be if you would have indigenous people's resource centers in every state university and college. Imagine if every local municipality or city would have a folk arts museum. Imagine if we would have more contemporary art spaces, not just in Metro Manila, but in the regions all over the country. Imagine if the more than 100 ethno-linguistic groups could have their uh, schools of living tradition documented and promoted. Yeah. There could be a resurgence and there is an ongoing yeah, yeah. resurgence of culture say from that, the work yeah. we are doing. You're, so, you're actually, well, you're seeing it in the metropolis with a private sector. I mean, um, the rediscovering, because you've discovered this way, way before. Decades yes, ago. But yes. they're rediscovering how uh, indigenous materials are actually very stylish and beautiful. You're seeing many designers already have pop-ups abroad. In a bigger scale, what can happen if the Department of Culture is formed? Well, first of all, all the institutions, namely the National Museum, which is under the Department yeah. of Education, even the National Book Board, perhaps, which is a little-known government entity which has never been funded, but which I funded last year to participate in the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is the biggest book fair in the world. Yeah. Uh, we can have the... Uh, Commission ng Wikang Filipino, yeah, yeah. Uh, the archives uh, of the Philippines, and even the Film Development Council, all of these and uh, many really it's more. it's exciting when you yes, hear it. Yes, all of these institutions which are part of the NCCA can actually be part of the Department of Culture. So we would see the promotion of indigenous art, the promotion and conservation of traditional art and modern art and contemporary art. We could see the documentation of more intangible heritage. What is intangible mm -hmm. heritage? Our poetry, yeah. our literature, our songs, our kundimans, our uh, hudhuds, yeah. uh, our culinary <laughs> yeah, art, yeah. our cuisine, our weaving, yeah. our handicrafts. We could see uh, more preservation of our built heritage. Just yesterday, and congratulations, yeah. you were uh, anchoring and um, doing an Ayuntamiento Forum of Harvard when you talked about built heritage. Yeah. I saw that. I follow you, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the most prominent <laughs> okay, figures on Instagram. You. And so that's good. We can see greater protection of our built heritage not just in the metropolis, but in every city and town. While we have the Heritage Act, where no structure 50 years old or older must be demolished, but we see a wanton disregard of heritage structures, even by departments of government. And that angers me. Mm. That makes me so angry and so incensed that we actually violate laws and we allow our culture to, to go by the wayside and don't give it its due importance. So I think uh, along with the talks on federalism, along with the talks of empowering our Bangsamora people, the creation of a Department of Culture will even empower our Bangsamora people even okay. more. Uh, uh, yeah. What does it take to form a department it just of, takes of legislation Karen. that's all it's because in the, it's, it's interesting uh, yung, uh, the DICT that transportation yes, I was the author yeah, of that. was broken and then I mean yes. in, the, in the sense of information is a separate department yes. now yes in fact uh, as the author of the Department of Culture it's been heard by Senator Cheese Escudero who is a chairman of the Education Committee it's already on the floor meaning plenary debates and so Hi, Cheese, you're listening. Okay. Yes. Can we prioritize <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah. And he knows. Uh, he's, I think it's uh, Congresswoman Escudero, the mother, um, who is the uh, author in the House, and that's great. And so it would be a great legacy for Cheese and I and yeah. our other colleagues. Uh, Cheese and I are uh, graduating from the yeah, Senate yeah. Um, by next year. And so he's very supportive, and his beautiful wife, Hart is a culture and arts advocate who I'm sure will be happy uh, with the creation. So we can see, I don't see any opposition with the creation of the Department of Culture. A part of it is the creation of the Institute of Living Tradition. Yeah. Many people would but ask... But that would be under yes, the Department of Culture. Under the Department yeah. of Culture. The Institute of Living Tradition, Karen, is really a uh, preservation of our living traditions. What are the living traditions? We don't have to house everything in a museum. We can actually go to a community and see what they do. And that is their SLT because there are SLTs or schools of living tradition in many 
uh, areas of our country, whether you are in the Cordillera or you are in Davao or you are uh, Amangyan in, in Mimaropa uh, or an Ivatan in Batanes, mm -hmm. which is a place where you intend to go uh, next month. So what I'm saying is that there are schools of living tradition, which presently and in the past years, I've been quietly funding and supporting yeah. together with the NCCA. We support their looms, we support their crafts, we support their ideas to perpetuate their uh, intangible heritage. All these schools of living tradition, which we have funded for more than a decade, will be uh, contained or, or uh, put together in an institute, and this will be taught in college courses. Uh, okay. So that yeah. all our state universities and colleges, and nothing will stop our private educational institutions from teaching our uh, living traditions. Yes, yeah. and under the uh, the deck, no, it will be called the deck if it's the Department of Culture. You also want the National Institute of Cultural Heritage Preservation and the National Institute of Culture and the Arts Management will be all under the Department of yes, Culture. Yes, yes. Uh, we also want um, arts it'll include, management. It will include training. Huh? Training. You yes. want certification now for cultural yes, officers. Yes, that would be great. They have uh, abroad, no? Yes, yeah. yes, because everywhere in the world, in Europe, yeah. in the US, and even ASEAN, we, we want uh, cultural experts, experts which yeah. we have already, yeah. which we have already. Let me just tell you, again, under the radar, from the work I'm doing uh, in contemporary art, we actually had the curatorial intensive last year. What is this? We brought Filipino curators from all over the world to the Philippines, and we invited international uh, curators, foreigners, to mentor them and teach them in an interactive workshop for one week and um, that was in partnership with the Metropolitan Museum and it was state funded and we call this the curatorial intensive and I do this every two years. It didn't come out in the news but it was well received and really lauded by curator, Philippine curators who don't have the chance to meet this international well-renowned yeah, yeah. curators. Second, just recently again under the radar in December we launched the Institute of Contemporary Art at the UP Diliman called PICAN. Oh, really? The PICAN is the Philippine Contemporary Art Network in the UP Vargas Museum. What does it mean? It will do research, documentation, uh, conservation, exhibition. Uh, it, it, it's, um, it's not just mounting a contemporary art exhibit in a gallery, which is the Vargas Museum. It, will do and it does intensive research it does documentation it will also do and it does publications so the whole gamut of um, documentation to promote contemporary art uh, i don't think there is one single uh, government institution yeah. or state funded institution that runs this whole thing. I actually discussed this many years ago with Dr. Patrick Flores, one of our top and um, really academic uh, researchers and uh, professors and curators of our country who's present, I think, in Dhaka in Bangladesh for a Biennale. And uh, he was our first curator in the Arts Biennale in 2015 in Venice. And that's how Pican was born. I said, Patrick, I want to set up similar to what we have in London, an institute of contemporary art that will not just be an art space. That's good to have an art space. You have an exposition, you have a gallery, fine. But to do research-based documentation and then publication and then interactive activities. So everything we want to do, this is for contemporary art. So you see, Karen, from funding schools of living tradition, which is the uh, art of our indigenous peoples, yeah to having indigenous people's resource centers. We already have the first in UP Visayas, which I funded, which is the IP, Indigenous People's Resource Center in UP Visayas. Again, under the radar, nobody has been there. Yeah. And then now, uh, of course, we uh, have been doing work for the contemporary art. We also have the um, uh, Venice Biennale, as you very well know. Yeah, yeah. And what we want to do is really promote our contemporary artists in the provinces and not to make it Manila centric. Yeah, yeah, because art right now, which is actually not fair, but then the 
I mean, even the business of buying art, it's all in Manila. Auctions are in Manila, which technically mm -hmm. you can move it out of Manila. Most of the but, galleries are. Yes, yes. But actually, we have very good galleries, even in, in Negros, yeah. for example. But you know what we did in 2015, you will know, mm -hmm. in the Venice Binale, Manny Montelibano, one of our artists, is from Negros. Okay. He's from now, Bacolod. What yes. are the activities lined up for National Arts Month? Undami. Because February, yes, what's your yes. priority? Oh, then we'll, well talk about Daya. Well, the NCCA has its activities, and, and that was um, uh, mentioned by you. May I mention yeah. some of the soon-to-be-launched uh, projects? We have a collaboration between the NCCA and the Intramuros administration. This is exciting. Nice. The former aquarium in Puerto Real will be converted into a Likhaan Center. Yes, uh, we have pop-ups, you have uh, crafts fair, you have uh, souks and, and uh, bazaars, etc. But to have a permanent site yes. for textiles, yes, yes, for like this. beads, okay. for crafts. Well, yes. Let's talk about this. And you know, this is beautiful. You know, it's, it's actually no surprise now that many people look Yes. For already, tiboli yes. tops, tiboli yes. skirts. I've been doing that for 20 years. Exactly. And I'm so glad that now, now. there is suddenly a resurgence. Uh -oh. This is, for example, made of 50-year-old wild cotton, which is no longer grown. Ah, and okay. so through the Filfida and the PTRI, we are promoting the planting of more cotton, and abaca because we need the raw materials here instead of importing cotton. Yeah. This is from Bugasong Antique. That's my home province. This is made from 50-year-old wild cotton. This is a traditional patadjong yeah, and the gorgeous. design is called pinilian. This is not machine made. It is handloom made by the women of Antique. Saakon yeah. Makasimanwa, very proud. And the head of their group in Barangay Bagtason is Mario Mansano. He's <laughs> an advocate. Ang galing galing. So, ang ganda-ganda po. If I can stand up, uh, yeah, i-full well, shot yeah. ng konti, ang ganda-ganda po. First Itong start. aking ginagamit ay tinali ko lang. Kung Actually, mahul... you wear it in the Senate. Yeah, I wear it in the Senate, yeah, yes. Yeah. I wear it in the Senate every day. I'm either from Antique or I'm from Tiboli. I'm... <laughs> and yeah, I just yeah. wear a t-shirt and um, it's beautiful. I wear it as a cape. I wear okay. it as a... And, and, and I, I, I'm giving that to you, oh, gifting it you. to you, hoping you could wear it in one of your shows. Yeah. And, um, and start. <laughs> but yes. wait, before anything is speak Speaking of Antique, tonight yes. the episode of Dayao is about oh, wow. Antique. Not to miss it, please. And I want it replayed and replayed because this is the first, one of the first time that the newly discovered rice terraces, not of Ifugao on, in Cordillera, but in General Fulion in Antique will be revealed. This came out in other TV shows, just a few in the past months, in the past year. But the whole documentation uh, is in ANC tonight in Dayao at 6.30 p.m. These are the Irainon, correct? Uh, Irainon Bukidnon indigenous peoples group who have been, not somewhere in time, uh, time warp. They have lived without government intervention and their harvest of rice is yeah, three times yeah. a year. Uh -oh. So Karen, they so, must be doing something right which okay, we're wait. not doing. So how long yes. do you intend? I'd like you to go there and walk there. Okay, yes. How long do you <laughs> intend to do Dayao? That's my last question because clearly you are really extremely passionate given... I mean, I'm not getting paid for Dayao. Yeah, oh yeah. So <laughs> that's the point, deva. Right? No, you have some with an impeachment trial that's possibly coming to the Senate oh, no. this year. Yes, oh, yes, the yes. General Appropriations Act for yes. 2019, and yet and so much other use, legislation. Yes, and, and yet, a fine time for Dayao. You find time for Dayao. Oh, I love Dayao. I look uh, forward to Dayao. Yeah, yeah. Oh yes. So where where is this coming from that you really want? Passion. Oh, yeah. Passion fuels me. I said it to Joan Ramirez of People Asia. She said, what is it that you're still as enthusiastic as you were decades ago? Yeah. I said, passion fuels me. Uh, I'm just so excited to do the things I do, whether it's climate or agriculture or education or culture and arts, whether it's what you see now, I think that is the UPO. Yeah. Yan yung UPO na ginagawa ng okay. ating Gamaba mm -hmm. awardee. There's so much to discover. And the more you know, the more you realize yeah. you the don't more know, you know much. Yeah, yes. the more, yeah. And I'd like to mention also okay. that one of the UNESCO or declared sites in Anini'i, a beautiful church in Anini'i Antique, will be the venue of a Philharmonic 
concert. Back to back kami ni Senator Drilon. He will have a concert of the Philharmonic in uh, a heritage site in Iloilo on March 2. And on March 1, there will be the first time a Philharmonic concert in the province of Antique in the UNESCO site, Anini Church. Okay, all right. On that note, I want to thank you, Senator, for coming to the show. Dayao is tonight, uh, the Antique episode. It airs, I'm right, at 6.30 p.m. Yes. On ANC. And also watch out for the replays of Dayao. Thank, thank you so you, much, Karen. Senator Lauren, for coming to the show. Let's get started today. I'm Karen Davila. Thank you for watching.